My first art school um, was Harrow School of Art in London. I was very fortunate, I got in very early on in the junior art school, which was a scheme that has been, well, it doesn't happen anymore, it hasn't happened for a long time. It means that they take students from 13 or 14 years of age and you do half art and half general studies, um, which was fantastic for, for a youngster. When I went to the, I got a scholarship, I think I was 20, to the Royal Academy schools and I was in the painting school there. Drawing was absolutely essential and you were um, encouraged to do as much as you could and also taken out on locations. And this, is, this absolutely appealed to me because, you know, it was an urban environment. After the first year, you could also do printmaking as well. And I became very enamoured by Gertrude Hermes and she was coming a day a week to do relief printing. And she was a very good, gentle teacher, I would say. And she, you know, she was very encouraging in a very lovely, quiet way. And I responded to her method of working. And I, I did a lot of printmaking while I was there before I finally finished after my third year. Because I started very young, um, I really, it took me some time to really find out what I really liked. Mm -hmm. You know, though you went to the Tate, you went to the National, there were certain paintings you perhaps were told to go and look at. Um, but I think that I was always attracted earlier on to art that had some sort of structure. So it was often not so much landscape, but more to do with buildings, uh, particular places, and um, something that certainly had a, a, a strong sort of structural underlying theme about it. And also, um, often these things were quite door. I, you know, I used to like um, old buildings and bridges and railways and things like that, <laughs> things of that sort, because I was an urban child. I, I had all my um, early life, well, really, and early adult life in London. I was very lucky to be able to buy a Colombian, a lovely old Colombian press, dated 1852, um, within a year or so after me leaving the Royal Academy Schools. I'd already told the printer's engineer who used to come in that I was interested because he used to get hold of, when he could, old presses and that perhaps weren't in such good condition from print works and places. And in a way, it sort of set me into doing printmaking more than anything else, in fact, for a number of years. Though I was, I still continued painting, but I, it, it coincided with a time when um, printmaking was really um, becoming much more popular. And I was exhibiting prints right from quite early on, and um, I used to do all my own printing. I'd make my blocks, lino and wood, and other things as well. And um, I was fortunate that I was selling a lot of work. During a sort of period, I suppose, from about in the 1970s going through into the 80s, um, my husband and I did a uh, because we had an etching press and a, a my Colombian press as well, we were able to do a lot of, as part from our uh, printing our own works, we did a lot of additioning for other artists because it was a period where printmaking was on, on quite a high in this country and it was taking off in a much more experimental way and a number of artists were... Um, being quite successful, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can be a good um, etcher or relief printer or lithographer, but you can't necessarily print an edition, do you? Actually, you can get a few prints looking okay, but not necessarily a whole edition. So um, we often got commissioned to print an edition or two or more from from the artists and uh, also for we did some work from editions electo and from christie's at one point as well and actually you learn an awful lot because you have to get into the mind of the artists 
We did some printing for Norman Aykroyd earlier on when he was abstract before he oh. went all re he went retro, and we did a, a few Chrissy Ors uh, early on, and oh no, all sorts of people. You know, we found it very uh, hard work, but very interesting, because again, it's another way you meet you meet other artists, and particularly the you know people that don't work that work in a totally dissimilar work to yourself. I taught um, part-time in art colleges for about 20 years. Teaching does, you know, as well as having some steady income, but it also means that you are relating to other artists and particularly students. It's very good, actually, to just talk to younger people uh, uh, and, and hopefully um, from what you, you know, you say to them that, that it, is, it is of help some of the time anyway. It worries me a lot in the sense that there's an awful lot of work now that it so seems to be just manufactured in the studio, not from any visual experience. And I, I, I don't, you know, I feel it doesn't matter how abstract your work becomes, I think, you know, there has to be that visual spark you know, you are looking, you are seeing, and you are digesting and, and interpreting what, what it, you know, what this world's about. I, I joined the Colchester Art Society, I think about somewhere between 15, 20, probably 20 years ago. The main benefit, I think, probably is the interaction with other people because artists can get very isolated because all the time, if you're doing, you're looking into yourself continually. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, and though often when I think artists aren't always particularly good at explaining what they do or conversing, but you know, there, there is a certain bit of rub off and uh, I think that's not a bad thing. And it, it is quite good to go and then see what other people have an exhibition and see what other people are doing. I came to watercolour much later than oil painting because during my training, um, uh, that was my main subject, painting and we, pe we worked in oils uh, um, traditionally, and I think that was you know, part of the era that I was a student, um, and that carried on. I, no one did watercolours because it was considered a, a sort of a rather fuddy-duddy um, evening class, if you were lucky, uh, old ladies sort of uh, <laughs> adventure. But so uh, it was rather looked down upon, and it was only till some, well, I suppose, at the end of my training, I began to see that there were a lot of artists that did some jolly interesting watercolours using that as a medium in an expressive and, um, you know, in a much more, up, let's say, up-to-date way. And, but it was very gradual and it really started because um, I was exhibiting quite a lot of drawings uh, um, and I just started perhaps adding a bit of, of wash to them, perhaps just one colour to just enhance things. And, and it, it, it went on from there, really. Uh, and then before long, I realized I was actually painting in watercolor uh, without, um, re well, not that I, I don't mean to say without drawing, because the drawing has been made initially. But when I'm actually working, I'm working quite directly with the watercolor, and I'm not following drawn lines, as it were. But that you know, has been a development. But and, uh, though I still paint in oils, I don't paint as much. So most of my work now is based on watercolour. Because right. I find that medium, I've, you know, I've found over the years that uh, it, it seems to suit the way I think. I think as far as subject matter goes, um, because of you know, my urban environment, um, I was always intrigued by looking beyond what was obviously in front of me. Like, for instance, in a street, I was always more interested in what was happening around the corner. And though I, uh, uh, the actual structure was important to me, and I, in a way, 
felt that it didn't mean so much for me to be in a landscape and looking at vast distance beyond. I wanted, to, I felt I wanted to make my own distance in a way. And um, it was a gradual development into working in buildings. I've always been interested in plant forms. And at some point they came together and I started working, and probably by accident, um, in places like conservatories or greenhouses. And it combined the fact that I had these structures, this man-made structure and the natural form of plants. And I, I was interested in the, the similarities and the things that are not similar, the ambu ambiguities of it all. And it developed on from there. And often not seeing, sometimes when you're looking through glass, you, you see beyond, but other times you get a blank. And I was very interested in that idea. Um, and I'd like to create a space within, let's say, the man-made structure of the space. Um, and hence, I think, areas that have got glass or open windows and doors, um, that, that was the thing that, that was sort of intrigued me, really and I wanted to try and do something with it. I think any creation, in a way, has got to be really come from the individual. I have to have sort of a visual, let's say, a visual excitement to start with, and I will see something that perhaps just gets me going, and then to find out really what, in a way, why it gets me going um, on something, I. I will make a drawing and sometimes that drawing develops into another drawing and, and, and so on. So I do use a sketchbook, I do go out, I draw on situations, um, and, but I don't attempt to paint at all because I, I, I don't want the local colour of anything to get in the way. Uh, I feel, I've, I've always felt quite strongly about that. That's uh, um, you know part of my reboot, really. Uh, and so I work, I suppose, in a fairly linear way, usually with sort of pencils and uh, charcoal sometimes, and you know more black and white. And I make coloured notes. I've got quite a good, I think, colour retentive memory. And uh, but I, I want to compose my own colour. When I start to work, and as I've said, I, it started with an idea, a drawn idea, um, and often I will then redraw, perhaps on other sheets of paper, my, uh, in a way, basic composition, um, because I'm recreating something, so I don't want to literally perhaps work from the one specific viewpoint. And so um, I will make, um, you know, I'll, have, I'll put ideas down, compositional ideas down on paper, and I'll sort out the format of how I'm going to work, whether it be an upright or horizontal, and the size of it. And I'll just perhaps make a few basic proportional lines, put it like that, no more than that. And I would have all my information around me so I've digested quite a lot before I actually paint, so that when I do paint, and again, thinking of the palette in the same way, I will usually work with one primary colour and its opposite, and then I will work between those two, and a bit perhaps going on the side, but I, I don't, I very, so I, I really do not work with three primary colours. I, so I do have a, a quite a definite idea on the range of colour I'm going to use. So when I begin, I, I then work relatively quickly because a lot of the preparation is already, I've assimilated that. And then I can work quite freely. And I'm very conscious that I, I want to um, express a particular depth in my painting that I have created and therefore the using the watercolour very thinly so that the white of the paper comes through and is very translucent um, actually suits what I'm trying to do so I'm trying to get the feeling that there is something beyond what I've already the mark I've made so that my marks 
work in a spatial way, um, as well as possibly in a, a more decorative way. So that is important. And I think it ties up, well I hope it does, with the sort of subjects that I'm trying to relate to.